now that we've gone through the basic budget, uh, I'll go through some of the percentages I looked at in particular categories, at least ones that were suggested. And I'm not going to use the exact same ones like the 50, 20, 30 like before. I'm going to go into these individual categories and the percentages that I've seen being placed out. Uh, I would definitely like to see a comparison. I haven't done a comparison with my particular budget now, but since I go through personal capital instead of a spreadsheet, it'd be interesting to see how my percentages compare that. Here we are back at it again. Hello, everyone. Uh, just want to say, I hope you all have had a wonderful two weeks. Um, I know this is definitely supposed to be a weekly series. At least I didn't say that out loud. I'm saying it now. This is intended to be a weekly series. I do apologize. I've definitely heard the, uh, the advice of bulk recording your content. And I've definitely felt myself in choosing to not do so. However, I definitely hope that the audio sounds much better than it did in the first episode. So we worked out a few things here. Um, I was also trying to find a different uh, video recording solution. However, we're going to stick with what we have for now. I thought I found a better alternative. Not really liking it. Doesn't have the uh, resilience that I need. Um, I don't really trust it that well. So maybe I'll do some tests and we'll figure that out. Anyway, once again. We're back at the Checkup Podcast, the podcast where we check up on each other, our goals, and our finances. I hope you're all doing very well today. Let's get into it. So, if you have not checked out my previous podcast, I did go into detail on my understanding on the benefits that creating a budget gives you, at least in the long term, as well as the short term. So, we're not really going to go into that again today. However, if you want to go check out the previous podcast, feel free to do so. I'll leave a link in the description. Today, we're going to go more into uh, what I think a basic budget should kind of be constructed of. Um, a little bit more detail on, I guess, if you wanted to make the different categories, what should be in them, and possibly some percentages if you really want to go that route and try to adhere to them. Up to you, of course. No worries. No worries. So, uh, I did mention that I made a, what I call a basic budget for a friend a couple years ago while I had been working for my current job for maybe about a year and a half, maybe about a year and a half, maybe just under two years. So, in that initial uh, budget, I only had, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I had eight categories. Eight might sound like a lot, but I've definitely seen a lot of budgets online. Some of them don't even have categories. Some of them just have a list of items. Some have too many categories, and trust me, I've, I've downloaded some of those templates, and they're just tremendous. Like. You can, you can keep track of things without going down to the, the smallest detail, unless it's something you really want to do. Be my guest. Feel free. Feel free. But uh, first on the category, gifts and donations. Um, I also have descriptions. I, I did say I was going to... I actually can't remember if I said I was going to put the basic budget in the, in the download link, but um, I'll just give you my email. And if you want the basic budget, just want to see what the template is, maybe I'll flash a picture of it up on the screen and you can copy it yourself. Just let me know. Uh, but yes, so I have descriptions for each of these, and then also I allow you to enter the amounts. The spreadsheet does its own thing, adds it all up in, the, in total uh, for each category as well as all together. There are a few things that aren't included in here, specifically taxes and um, if you have uh, pre-tax deductions out of your income. That's not going to be on here. I can make a different budget for that, but I'll also uh, describe my initial budget that did include that. However, so... First off, gifts and donations. Uh, those consist of for birthdays, holidays, uh, tithes, and charity. Um, really, I didn't, I didn't put a percentage to that. Of course, that's all based on you personally, uh, what causes you're giving to, what's important to you. Um, it could be 5, 10, 15%, however you want to live your life. No problem, no problem. The next one is housing. Housing is possibly the second biggest category. Um, Actually, I think it yeah, definitely is the second biggest category. For housing, we have rent and mortgage. I put them together because you could have one or the other. You could even have multiple. They all go here. Uh, utilities. Uh, utilities would go for gas, water, electric, trash, internet, phone, and cable. Some of these may be included in your rent. So I guess technically you don't have to list those here. If you do pay for them separately, um, if you do have an apartment that does that, or you have a condo or a house, these utilities, they need to be paid individually every month. So make sure to keep track of it. I would suggest, if you can, to set up auto payments. 
Um, otherwise, you're going to have to just remember the date, put it in your phone, put it on your calendar on the fridge, and you have to manually go in and do it, which isn't a problem. Um, I technically do that for my credit cards. I pay before the due dates, especially before the, uh, the new cycle starts. But I have everything else set on auto pay, and some of them go from directly from my checking account. Some of them go from my credit cards. It just depends on uh, what that system or that account would allow me to add for, pay for a payment method. Next, we have supplies. Uh, supplies is kind of a general category, but I put in here detergent, light bulbs, paper utensils, storage bags, laundry. Um, in that case, laundry, laundry items, different detergents, fabric softeners. Uh, just different general items that go around your house. I guess you could put batteries on here if you wanted to, to keep that in mind. If you knew you used them up, but batteries last month, so maybe not. But who knows? Who knows? Maybe you have a whole office set up like I do, and you need to replace uh, electronics. You know, every every once in a while. Uh, next is toiletries: soap, shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste. Pretty self-explanatory. And then I have renters and home insurance. Renters slash home insurance. Uh, if you have an initial deposit, you should get back, you know, as long as you kept the place clean. That doesn't go in here. This is specifically if you actually have, uh, I believe, a monthly payment for renter's insurance or home insurance. Next is groceries. Uh, <laughs> a little side note I have for this category is try not to starve. Buy snacks. Make sure they're healthy snacks. I've definitely gotten more into that. Doing, doing that myself, I uh, would say around last fall, maybe April, September, I stopped, and that's say April, September, August, September. I'm sorry about that. I decided I want to go on the Mediterranean diet. I'm not fully on it at this point in time as uh, it got kind of hard over, over the winter and those few trips I had in, uh, during the winter break. However, I've definitely tried to expand the range of things that I can make myself and more so saying no to this than yes to only these things. That has definitely helped me a lot. So it's kind of a, an, uh, <laughs> an adjusted uh, Mediterranean budget. I mean, Mediterranean diet. Jeez, my goodness. So, whatever amount goes in here, goes in there. Uh, groceries, I go to Mariano's two to three times a month, and I'll sp spend anywhere from 30 to 70 bucks. So, I could possibly spend 200, 250 a month. I could possibly spend 80 or 90. It really depends on what I'm eating, what I decide to cook, uh, how in depth I want to go on my recipes or the variety of recipes I want to have. I'm trying to get more into meal prep. Uh, grabbing some nice shiny glass meal prep containers would be awesome. They are quite expensive, even on Amazon. We'll see about that. But yes, um, at least in this case, with this, um, I could even add another sheet onto it where you can track your monthly expenses in each of these categories. Um, make sure that they are accurate. So that month to month, you can kind of see, you know, how it goes up and down. Or you can use Personal Capital. Personal Capital is the app that I choose to track my net worth. I also use it to track my different categories for my spending as well. And from month to month, I can go in and see that particular expense, how it's gone up and down every month, or for all my expenses together, a category of expenses. It's pretty nice. I do love the app. I do have a link for that in the description in this video. I also have it in the last video as well. Check it out. Transportation. So, oh, very simple. Only five things here. Uh, car payment, CTA, Metro. If you have a, well, I live in Chicago. We have the CTA. I'm not sure what your train or bus systems are called. Um, ours is also, also called the L here in Chicago. So I guess I have to say car payment or I guess to say what, uh, public transportation pass, your public transportation card, uh, maybe bus, bus fare, bus, train fare. That's probably an easy way to say it. Uh, that goes on the first line. Next is gas. If you do have a car and you do drive often, I drive for work. I drive to get groceries. I drive to visit family. I also just drive to drive. I just have this innate <laughs> longing to drive around my city. I do love my city, whether it's rain, cold, sleet, snow, maybe not in the sleet and snow, but at least when the weather is nice or decent, even if it's cold, if it's nice and dry outside, I'm fine. If it's a little rainy, that's cool. Uh, I like to drive around my city, find new places, uh, new restaurants, uh, just see kind of how the different neighborhoods are set up. And then also, we also have the whole Lakeshore Drive where you can see the lake, Lake Michigan. It's a wonderful view from north to south. I also just cruise down the highways because why not? Just blast my favorite music. Sometimes I do have a co-pilot. Sometimes I don't. Just by myself. It is what it is. So my, <laughs> my car sips fuel. So I'm not wasting money specifically. I guess you can call it a waste. Of, I should be saving more gas. We're going to move on to the next. Car insurance. Um, I definitely started paying that 
Actually, I've only, I haven't been paying that too long because, again, I mean, I turned 26 this year. So only after 25 that I have to start getting some of these added on to my particular budget. Like I said in the last podcast episode, some of these things didn't apply to me. And also some of them I didn't even know I really needed to spread out. I thought health insurance covered vision and dental. It does not. They are separate. Case in point here, uh, next registration fees every year. You got your plate sticker. You got your window sticker. If you're getting a new car, that's a whole process in its own. It may, may have a few more items in there, depending on where you live, what state you live in. And then maintenance. You really don't have to put maintenance here. Maintenance is more, I say, a placeholder. So if you want to make a separate account for expenses that will come up related to your car, getting new tires, if your windshield got cracked or broken because, you know, an accident or, you know, the weather outside or you have an old vehicle, something like that. I generally keep track of my receipts when I take my car in to get serviced. So I pretty much know how much I'm going to pay every time. And technically, if I wanted to, I could average that out every month and put money in it like that. I don't do it that way. If you have a car that requires more, requires to be maintained more often, or you do your maintenance yourself, that's what I think this line item would be very good for. Uh, next, we have health. Only four items. Health insurance, eye care, dental care, life insurance. That's it. I don't, I don't really know of anything else. Um, technically, I guess you can put now that I, I actually made this before I had one of these, a health savings account. You can put that in there. It's not really an expense. It's more of a transfer. So that's another reason why on this particular budget, I kept this as all expenses, transfers, whether pre-tax or after tax, I kind of left off. I keep track of those elsewhere. And let's see, I had a sign off for health insurance, maybe taken out of your paycheck 25 years plus. Oh, yes. So if you have health insurance with your with your company where you work, um, that can be deducted pre-tax, you know, before your actual paycheck comes in. Uh, that's how mine is. Uh, technically, that's how all of these are, except for life insurance. Life insurance I have somewhere else. Uh, personal flexible. So this is that uh, that this is that 20 percent. Well, what I limit to 20 percent, maybe for you, 30 percent on your flexible spending for your budget. We have cell phone. To be honest, I, I didn't enjoy how much my cell phone cost and giving that money over to my parents because we're on the same uh, line together. I was like, I don't need an upgrade. I chose not to upgrade my phone. I still have a Note 9. It works perfectly fine. This year, though, I've, I think I'm going to try out uh, Apple for once just to see if I like it. If I don't, I have this as a backup. And if I do decide to keep it, I kind of want to use that more as a business phone slash for the very important people who would like to FaceTime me, but can't because I can't FaceTime them, but my bubbles have a different color. I mean, it's, hey, it's a business, it can be a business expense. It can be a very good business expense. And it'll be very useful in the long run. New phone, why not? Uh, clothing, shirts, shoes, coats, jewelry. Simple enough. Uh, I mentioned a story about uh, how I go to a mall, go to all the guys' stores, and then go back and buy what I want. Sometimes I, I don't do that all the time. I definitely do not. Nobody, I don't have time for that all the time. Sometimes I just walk into TJ Maxx or Burlington, walk out with a few things, try not to spend over 100 bucks. I'm straight. I might have a few outfits, actually. It's, it's not that bad. Trust me. It isn't. Entertainment, recreation, fast food movies, going to the club, if you do that, uh, concerts and games. Lots of different options here. But you may, you may be trying to include this in there, but nope, the next line item is subscription. So... What could be entertainment or creation, going to the gym, if you have a membership for another place, uh, what else would have, have that? I don't, I'm pretty sure there's probably some place in your city or state where you go to and they have like a monthly payment so you don't have to pay as much every time you go in. I'm pretty sure you have something like that. So Spotify, Netflix, gaming, gym, etc. for subscriptions. Hobbies. What do you like to do? I, I BMX, I, I game. I like to eat. I actually like to eat. I don't have a budget for eating, though I only eat out on the weekends. So I cook during the week. I eat out on the weekends. That's kind of how my, my budget is set up. That's how my diet plays through. I adhere as much as I can to my diet from Monday to Friday. Once Saturday comes, it's over. Over. I'm relieving myself. Pets. I have a dog now. Nova. She... I just took it to the vet yesterday. She's gained 10 pounds in like five to six weeks. She's, she's 24 pounds now. She's, uh, she's a big one. She's, uh, she's growing very well. But I feed her well as well. She probably eats better than I do. Hmm. 
Uh, next, next, next. So for pets, I put behavioral classes, food, litter, or doggy bags, uh, medicine, toys, and here you can put uh, treats. Um, she goes, she goes through quite a few treats. I try to keep her entertained. I um, haven't gone through behavioral classes yet, but so far I'm training her myself. So one that saves money, two, it's more of a bonding experience as well. And then I have random. Um, maybe I shouldn't have this on here. I shouldn't give you an opportunity to have this category, but in personal flexible, I have random. And my note is Amazon and store impulse buys. This is if you know you have a habit of going in and buying something. Whether you really, really needed it or you just wanted it, throw some money to the side for that so that you don't accidentally start pulling money from places that you really don't want to pull it from. <laughs> That's my advice to you. If you, can, if you can withhold yourself, you don't need this line item. I probably buy from Amazon two or three times a year and I buy in bulk. When I mean bulk, I mean stuff that I've wanted for months may even be removed from the cart, added later, completely removed, replaced with something else that I wanted at the time. That gives me the opportunity to actually say, how much do I want this item? Do I feel like parting with this money for it right now after I've been waiting for it? That's how I shop for Amazon. That kind of goes with Best Buy, all those other stores as well. Uh, especially B&H, since we're going to be going some, getting some more camera equipment. Or maybe I'll go refurbish to the Canon website. We'll see. I like Sony cameras. Can't really find them refurbished much. So I'm not sure about the used market. So I might be trying to save some money going with Canon, but we'll see. If I can fork out the cash for Sony, you guys will you guys will know. You guys will definitely know. Last two categories. One, saving. Short-term, mid-term, emergency fund. You should have an emergency fund. You should be building one. Case closed. I'd say three to six months of expenses. If you want to stretch it out, 12 months. I would not suggest less than three months of expenses. And that's based on you knowing exactly the money that needs to come out of your account every month. Times three, times four, times six, times 12, however you want to do it. If, uh, if you're trying to do long term, you can even have two years. Uh, the, the, the YouTube channel that I listed on my last podcast episode in the description, how was it? Uh, our, was it our wealth journey? Wow. I don't know why it escapes me right now. They have two years worth of expenses saved away. Much more than I actually. Yes, yeah, still much more than I have, but I definitely have more than that tucked away but it's not all specifically for an emergency fund next uh plan based purchases furniture furnishing my apartment was detrimental to my bank account because i was like i didn't think it would cost this much but once i moved in and i was by myself i, I had to furnish the place i had to do it. i still haven't even furnished my bedroom really i just have my bed and like one little area to like put clothes in like those little pull-out cubbies everything else is in the closet or one of those plastic bins where you, you put the lids off yeah, I need to actually furnish my bedroom. I don't need it though right now. I got my office, the living room and dining room. It's all good. The kitchen, all set. Bathroom, set. I don't need to put any more money into the bedroom. Not like that. Not for now. Not right now. Maybe when I move. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, traveling. Any new trips coming up? Uh, down payments. House. I guess you can down payment on a car. I would suggest buying used. Um, if you want to buy something new or used, at least go four years, at least wait till it's four years old. Most of the depreciation will have had, you'll pay a lot less money for it. Um, just how I want to do, you can do all cash if you really want to, there's no problem with that. And then electronics. Most of my electronic purchases, I said cameras, I have my studio here. I have PC that I built just over a year ago, studio monitors, studio headphones. I have a bunch of electrical equipment behind me on this shelf, uh, two gaming monitors in front of me like i have the whole setup i have a gaming laptop that i most of my like my purchases for electronics are definitely over seven to eight hundred dollars that, that, that's just how it is and like i said i buy at the same time i bought most of this all at once it hurt my wallet but i think it was well worth it anyway. and then last for saving long-term investment i put seven years plus technically for a roth ira after five years you can technically start taking any money out from what was it well technically you can put money in any money you've put in you can take out any point but the gains you get from it will still be a substitute to a fee for being taken out before a certain age but there's really two categories you have taken out too early as an age and then taken out too early as in it hasn't been long enough after five years you no longer get tax on those 
gains that you put in a Roth IRA. However, if you're still with under a certain age, you'll still pay a fee for taking them out early. So once you hit the age mark, let's, let's say whatever that age mark is, you put money five years before then. After that five year point and you hit that certain age, there's no fee of any kind. You take out the gains however you want to. It's on you. Uh, I'll definitely write that down. Maybe pop up on the screen right here. Or I'll just throw it in, <laughs> do a voiceover and just throw that as well. I mean, I'll put it in the description. I just start typing out my descriptions. Yes, that's actually good. If I can actually take what I'm saying here and put, in, uh, put it in text, that might be helpful for some of you. And the last category is debt. Three bits. Only three bits in here. Credit card debt. Try not to have any. Try not to have any as in whatever money you're putting on that credit card, make sure it's already in your checking account or about to hit your checking account, like within a day or two or three. Pay it off. Just don't leave it sitting on the card. The companies can still see that you're using your credit, but you don't have to let the credit companies, you know, Equifax and TransUnion see these amounts. You don't have to. The companies that you're using the cards for, they see you're using it. And every year or so, they'll give you a bump. You know, as long as you're using it, you're fine. Uh, school loans. I have them. I have them. I have plenty of them. I'll try to pay those off by the time I'm 30. So, three and a half years. I'm all right. And then other, other debt. Um, technically, house mortgage could be that. Uh, you may have a private loan from an institution or an individual that can go in there as well. But yeah, uh, you really want to minimize your debt if you can. Because, I mean, your debt to income ratio is a big thing when you're applying for bigger loans, especially for something like a house. So, now that we've gone through the basic budget, uh, I'll go through some of the percentages I looked at in particular categories, at least ones that were suggested. And I'm not going to use the exact same ones like the 50, 20, 30 like before. I'm going to go into these individual categories and the percentages that I've seen being placed out. Uh, I would definitely like to see a comparison. I haven't done a comparison with my particular budget now, but since I go through personal capital instead of a spreadsheet, it'd be interesting to see how my percentages compare to that. So maybe I'll do that at the end of the video or in the next episode as well. So, uh, right before we hit that, I need to change the battery in my camera. We'll be back in just a second. So we're going to get into these percentages for these categories in the budget. Not the individual items, not the individual line items in the categories, but just the category itself. The individual light items are definitely going to be skewed a lot more, and it's kind of hard to keep that in check. So, especially if you don't mind splurging or spending more on one category versus another. So we're not going to worry about the individual light items. We're going to focus on the categories themselves. So my first budget that I ever made, uh, I had most of these. Giving, housing, groceries, transportation. I put home security. That technically can go into utilities as well. I do have a, a service on my phone where I can monitor uh, my alarms at home as well as my cameras Let's see uh, health life insurance personal flexible savings debt pretty much you know mostly the same thing only one two three four five six seven eight nine i put 10 categories all in all there's really maybe eight on here so yeah i separated these long ago before i started really researching uh a good way to put these together but yeah, that basic budget was my own design. This was me just copying from the internet. So, giving range 10 to 15%. Really based on your personal preference. How, is, how important is this cost to you? Housing specifically. So, we have 25 to 33%. I believe in most cases it would be 25% of your take home pay or no more than 33% of your gross income. So, whatever, you get, whatever they're telling you you're getting paid at your job, multiply that by 40 hours a week, 52 weeks in a year. This is some days you, I mean, technically, there are some days you can come into work, but then there are some days you're going to tell you no. And unless you're salaried or full time, you're not going to get PTO for those days. So kind of just take that in mind when you're doing this calculation. Uh, if they don't tell you your, your yearly um, salary from the beginning. But yeah, so no more than 30% of your gross, maybe 25% of your, your take home pay. You can still go up to 30, 33. That's your discretion. This range is here just for. Uh, just a bird's eye view. Utilities, 5 to 10%. Again, I don't know what mine follow, fall through, but um, they, definitely could be, they definitely could be lower. Um, in this winter time, I think my, I just got my last uh, gas bill. It was just under $200. It's, uh, yeah, I didn't like that at all. 
Um, though I live in the basement, both of my doors kind of seep heat through. So I should probably find something to block those doors with. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I, I try to find, I try to do my best to not leak money from my budget, but then also not, uh, I don't want to continue to freeze anymore. I just pile blankets on top. That's usually how I get rid of it. But I don't turn it off when I leave the house, which is a problem. So I want my dog to stay warm. Eh. Let's go say. Uh, groceries, 5 to 15%. I don't know how big of a family you are, how, how big of a family you have. I don't know if you have any dependents. I don't know if you're just living with roommates and splitting food or if you have, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, either or. Transportation, 10 to 15%, 10 to 20%. Let's just say 10 to 20. On the high end, if you're like paying for a vehicle, that definitely shouldn't be more than 10%. You might want to cap it at five, but I say no more than 10% for your car. Maybe 15 on the high end. If you really need to have that car, maybe you don't. You probably don't if you're young and have time before you get your dream car. Buying cash, like I said before. 20% for the category, I believe. <clears throat> I have 20% for that category. Let's see, 50, 20, 20. No, it wouldn't be. Because unless 20%, if you're doing 50% for the expenses and almost half of that is for transportation, I guess that depends on where you live. Hopefully most of that isn't for the car payment itself. If you do have a car payment, hopefully most during that is split between other things. Definitely that car payment should not reach more than 15 or 20%. Your gross income. Don't do it. Don't do it. <clears throat> uh, health, five to ten percent. See what did that? See, I don't even have some of these actually in there. I had the percentage, but because I wasn't putting money towards it, I don't actually have it in here. Um, this particular budget when I started it back when I was in college, it would give me the percentage for take home and gross. It would also give me the monthly and yearly expense, all in columns next to each other. That's kind of half the setup. Maybe I'll put like a little little image splash up on the screen for any of you who are watching the video. By the way, there are a few more platforms you guys can check out the podcast audio only. Check it out in my link tree. I'll put them down in the description as well. Life insurance, 10 to 25%. That's definitely a bit high. That is definitely a bit high. And even for the amount of life insurance that I have, it's probably around just under 10%. If I increased it, if I took some more term and put it into whole uh, life insurance, it would definitely go up at this point in time. I don't think I'm ready to make any more jumps, but we'll definitely see. We'll definitely see. Uh, the earlier you do it, the more benefit you get out of it, of course. Personal and flex, personal slash flexible, like we said, 20%. Uh, for me personally, it can go as high as 30. For mine, I limit it to 10 to 15%. And outside of those random splurge per, uh, purchases or those big purchases, that's the only times where I really leave this category. Uh, I paid off a nice chunk of my loans in 2021. Yeah, so in 2020, I finished paying off my car. 2021, I, uh, sorry about that. I paid off a nice chunk of my student loans that went directly to the school. So actually, they were accruing interest while everything else wasn't, which was kind of lame. But so I was like, right, let me just pay it off. I want to give you guys no more interest. And then right in 2020 as well, at the end of 2020, I had started furnishing my apartment. So I had multiple big expenses kind of back to back. And funny thing is, I still want to maybe not upgrade my car. Eventually, I'll keep it for now, but I, I still want a motorcycle. That's, that's probably the next big expense, if anything, other than moving. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, saving, 10 to 15%. That would be short-term and long-term debt. So, again, I'm trying to stick to 30, 30%. I'm saving, what did I say last time? Like 35 36% of my take-home pay. Not bad, but I, I'm... I'm sacrificing things in order to do that. So it's not just, oh, I can afford to put the money aside. I could put that money towards, you know, uh, like I said, many other causes that I would like to get into, many other things I would like to learn. I'm trying to be more strategic about it, though. And when I start taking that money to put in those different other categories for as personal development goes, I'm hoping that either one, I make that money back from the experience or whatever knowledge I've learned, I can like increase that, you know, give me, give my return back for one. Um, two, hopefully it makes me a healthier person. Um, as well as wiser. And then three, what was the third one? What was the third one? Oh, yes. 
it may not it, it, there should be like some immediate return or immediate use from it so the camera equipment things for this office my studio here that all kind of has a finite it's technically a finite use for it and at least for a business i can possibly deduct that as an expense or at least over time depreciate some of those things so we'll see how it goes and then i have debt student loans I didn't even put that category. I just said student loans, 10%, immediate, 10%. But like I said, for me to pay them off sooner, I'm probably going to, even if they're around a three to 400 mark, I'm probably going to need to double that to get the, to pay them all off by the time I am 30. And in May, right before my birthday, uh, the, uh, the accrual of interest is going to restart back on them. And I definitely have over 30,000 at this point in time, a decent amount over 30. So. We'll see where it goes from there. I was definitely mid forties when I when I when I graduated. So <laughs> I've been I've been doing decent since then. But since we haven't needed to put any more money in, I've kind of just put my money more into investments like the stock market because that technically should yield me a better return. Since I think my loans are definitely under four percent for interest, so why not? Why not? So those are those percentages there. Um, I did. Give a link for a pay, uh, take home paycheck calculator at my last podcast. I'll definitely put it down in the description as well. If you wanted to do a proposed budget like this and you didn't want to do a spreadsheet like I have, you can definitely use that. I would also advise you to download the personal capital app. I definitely prefer it much more than Mint. If you have Mint, it's fine. Um, you don't have as much control over like the individual categories and where things go, and you can't see. The bird's eye view that I'm looking for as far as net worth and uh, savings growth. It kind of just puts everything together. You can't make any new categories, really. Like, for instance, I don't like how if I can't sync an account to Mint, it just goes into other. I don't like that at all. I hate it. At least in personal capital, I can make a hypothetical account. Even if I can't link it, if there's no login for it, or if I don't want to add that to personal capital, I can just say there's this much in this account. And just keep track of it. I can just update it manually, or I can sign in. You know, authentify, authentify it properly, of course. You know, and I, I do trust the app. I do trust the app. That's how most of my stuff. Uh, that's how I track most of my accounts, whether it be cash investments or you know credit cards, things like that. That's how I track most of my net worth. And watch it grow or decrease over time because stocks do plummet every once in a while. So does crypto. I have my crypto accounts. Not specifically linked, but I, I have them in there. Whatever money is in that crypto account is technically looking at like cash. But if it goes up over time, I'll adjust the amount. I probably adjust it once every month, sometimes every three months. But as long as I'm consistent with doing it, it would technically be fine. So we've gone over the basic budget and some percentages for the categories, as well as high view, the different line items that can go into these categories. So let's say you have your budget done. You have your category set up at least for what is applicable to you right now. Uh, if you have a situ any of your situations, personal life situations are going to change soon. Definitely throw the line items in there just so you can have them at the ready. You don't have to try to remember it later on. You'll definitely be fine with that. Slightly cricket, I think. Slightly, slightly, slightly. Sorry. CD. Oh, I made it worse. <laughs> okay. So uh, what I think happens after this moment? What happens after you have your basic budget and you're pretty much set? Well, I start looking towards uh, Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant. Um, before I really took a, a decent look at it and started filling it in with like what I think could go into those different qu uh, quadrants as far as like, uh, well, for one, it's uh, employed, self-employed on the left-hand side, employed, self-employed on the left-hand side. This, this is my left hand. And then on the right, you have business. And then investor, so like stocks and everything, but business owner up here above that. So you want to eventually move from the left side to the right side. I think on a video, I should be doing it this way, but we'll figure that out. You want to be moving from the employee self-employed side to the business owner investor side. That's the biggest thing. Um, for the most part, employee, you're only an employee for a certain amount of time. Self-employed, you're self-employed as long as you want. A business owner, the business should be able to run without you at some point. Residual income from that point on, start another business, sell it, make a lot of money, however you want to do it. Investor, long-term gains, and then eventually, once the next egg is big enough, or if you can throw a chunk of change in there, technically lump sum investing is better than dollar cost averaging, but 
if you don't have the funds for that, definitely don't try to time the market. Dollar cost average it every week, every month, however you can afford to do so to split up the costs. Uh, I use M1 Finance for that specifically. You can have the money taken out every week, every other day, once a month and just put it into some low cost index funds, you'll be fine. So seven years plus, like I said before in mine, uh, get that nest egg growing. And then from that point on, you can start your selling it, selling off your assets at three to 4%. Uh, if you want to start moving those assets later in life over to ones that pay dividends. So like REITs, uh, dividend stocks, or, uh, I would say not mortgage REITs, uh, equity REITs, um, a lot, of, a lot of the things in like the real estate and energy sector have high dividends as well. <clears throat> even companies not in those sectors have dividends. If you want to start moving it closer to that, even bonds as well. Um, inflation protected uh, assets, tips as well, or long-term bonds. You don't really want to invest in short-term bonds. You want to go for the long-term bonds if you can, unless there's a good rates. Uh, technically, Series 1 bonds currently have like 7% interest. So I've thrown a little bit of money in there. Uh, you can only get, get get to them from a government website, actually. But you can buy a certain amount every year up to a limit. But as long as you don't go over that limit, you can just buy more every year. And you'll just get the interest from it into the account. You'll be fine. That, I don't know if I can put in personal capital, but I'll definitely try to. <coughs> so, uh, from that particular point, uh, again, before I was looking at the cash flow quadrant, I would say, all right, you have your main source of income. Uh, you invest. And at that point on, as long as you're taking care of yourself, your means are met, or you need more income to take care of your means, take care of your debt. If you're, if you want to increase your living situation without, you know, incurring increased debt or living paycheck to paycheck, or you one day want to, you know, send your kids off to college or raise a family like that. I'm going to make sure that you yourself, you're healthy, your mind is growing. You personally and socially are growing as well, spiritually course one two three um as i mean you're gonna be working on that throughout your life but you definitely want to at least make sure you yourself are working on improving who you are as a person you know what you can contribute to society and then from that point on uh you take your investments and you can kind of diversify it up i mean you don't have to wait till then start early like i said before start early but from that point on you have stocks and real estate <laughs> pretty simple uh stocks and bonds what was it the bugle was it so vanguard is technically like one of the first index fund companies i believe that was out there so they initially said uh I believe it, was, it was like 80 percent, 10 and 10 or maybe 80 15 5 anyway they said uh long-term index fund international uh international stocks so u.s stocks are like the north america u.s stocks international stocks and then bonds for the last couple of years, bonds have been kind of underperforming even stocks that don't have much growth because they pay dividends. Um, international stocks are a bit more volatile than what we have here. So personally, on my end, I would rather do 80 to 90% uh, US, uh, North America, and then the other remaining percentage to get to 100, I would do something more volatile. I probably wouldn't do international stocks specifically. I'll probably want to go into a different fund that definitely has more growth potential than say the S&P 500. So that would be like the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ has outperformed the S&P 500 for a long time. Though for the past couple of years, I've kind of been neck and neck, but the NASDAQ has a lot more volatility to it. So in the short term, they may have similar returns, but in the long term, I believe the NASDAQ should win out. You can invest in individual stocks if you want to. I would say no more than 5% in individual stocks. So if you have a $100 going into M1 Finance and you split up your pie chart, you make it in pie charts and that's how it divides up your money automatically. You can only buy stocks once a day on the uh, non-premium platform or version, but you're not really throwing money in every day, are you? You can if you want to. Um, but at least at that point, if you throw $100 in, more than $5 should be going to one particular stock. It should mostly be funds or if you want to do funds and individual stocks, do at least 10 stocks you don't have to do 60 i say you could do 10 to 30 stocks if you really want to and make that more than no more than 10 to 15 percent make sure you research those stocks though i can go into that on the next episode maybe the next episode after that on exactly what to look for when it comes to picking stocks when it comes to picking index funds etfs of that sort i got you i got you i've been doing this for a while myself so i got you 
so yeah so stocks real estate that could be long-term holding real estate investing put a tenant in it hopefully that tenant stays as long as they can doesn't give you any issues put a new tenant in or hopefully they stay for years and years to come you ain't got to worry about it um it was definitely easier when um interest rates are low definitely easier when the housing market isn't at its best but the best time to invest for anything is now find whatever opportunities you can get into and make sure you do your research as well so from that point on i would say then go into your side hustle so if you want to learn a particular skill if you already have a particular skill if you're knowledgeable about something that you can teach or if say you already have an ability that somebody else wants to know and you can teach them that way. So <clears throat> technically you can make money having conversations with people in English because they want to practice their English. Um, if you actually want to teach English, I believe you do need a, at least an associate degree, if not a bachelor's degree for, for some of the other sites. If you want to teach, teach, <clears throat> let's say you want to tutor. If you're a college student or a high school student, tutoring is a wonderful option. Or let's say you're into computers, you're into software, you want to get into coding, you can start designing people's websites. You can start designing apps, like little gaming apps on your own. Uh, <laughs> little gaming apps yourself. Uh, Angry Birds was a hit, was a hit. All those different types of games like that. The other one, it was, I forget the one, it was just, the bird would just go up, down, it was like pipes and everything. Whatever, whatever game that was, they made, they, they made some money from that. They definitely made some money from that. Yeah, so side hustles, get into the side hustles. That's where I said previously that most of the black YouTubers I saw were talking about side hustles, at least the younger ones. Uh, anyone who was older was talking about investing in real estate, uh, actually having a business with credit cards, whether it be uh, lending, uh, well, using, using, your, your, using your credit, having other people use you know, your credit uh, to kind of raise their score. There's a term for that. I'm not going to go into that right now. And then also, if you want to resell, reselling things uh, like uh, very niche watches, like the very expensive ones, maybe a thousand, five, ten thousand dollar watches, thirty, thirty thousand dollar watches. If you can get your hand on hold of that and resell it to somebody else, make the difference. You can do that with cash. You can also do it with credit cards. Mm, do it at your own risk. Make sure you know what you're doing. But yeah. So side hustles, in my opinion, eventually can grow into a flourishing business depending on how what systems you put in place you have to put systems in place otherwise you're always going to need to be there or you're always going to need to be the center of attention if you kind of want that that's fine try to automate as much of the process as you can but definitely have systems in place in case you want to start hiring people in or start replacing yourself to go to a different venture or just enjoying free time we definitely have that we'll definitely have that oh but yeah watching some of my favorite business podcasts online I have a long list, a very long, I need to go back through some of those episodes and actually write down what some of those guests did and follow them on social media so I can be seeing what they're doing in the world on my Instagram. So when I wake up every morning, I can be like, all right, what's going on? Yes, I, kinda, I check my phone throughout the day. It's, it's a problem, but it's okay. I'm looking at more motivational, inspiring stories and feeds every day. I'm adding more people onto my roster. So check it out. Also, I also have an Instagram for this podcast as well, so. I'll throw down in the description. It would help if you throw some likes down there. Follow me for more uh, informational content, uh, whether it be pictures or just more clips from other interviews, or upcoming interviews possibly, or even just really keen points that some of you might have pointed out in previous podcasts. Those are going there as well. And you can also talk and ask me questions there as well if you don't want to put it in the comment sections below. But definitely comment. Comments are awesome. Also give me... Uh, a way to kind of gauge what my audience is kind of thinking about or where they are in life as well as, as far as finances, goals, and etc. So just a few things that ran off the top of my head as far as the cash flow quadrant is concerned. I actually mean to have meant to get uh, the book from Robert Hiyosaki, both the cash flow quadrant and the one specifically on real estate. I don't remember the name of it, but I know what the book looks like. It's probably in my Amazon cart somewhere with all the other dozens of books I eventually will get. But yeah, so I said, employee, have a job, your main job, side hustles. If you don't want to deal with other people, or you want to kind of work, do a side hustle from home, you can. Uh, you can make tons of money with an online business. Many people today are growing online businesses and killing it. I'm trying to start it now, but I'm at the very beginning of my journey. So it's going to take many, many more months, possibly a few years to see where this goes. But at least I'm getting started early. So 
Uh, stock trading, options trading, that's what I want to get into now, actually. Uh, you can do vending machines. Uh, you can do wholesaling real estate if you, want to do, if you don't want to do particularly buy and hold. That's more long term, of course. It's extra income, but unless you're using the Burr method, uh, buy, buy, rehab, refinance, repeat, um, you're not going to see those high returns that I think a side hustler should kind of give you. Whether it's, if you're putting money into something, you kind of want a higher return, especially if it's not something like the stock market, you're eventually building up whether an audience or a product or an asset that will pay you many more dividends over a short amount of time than say the average seven to 10% from the stock market. So if you're gonna spend your time on something, keep that in mind, keep that in mind. You want to grow it so you're not kind of wasting your time or at least enjoy it at the beginning and then see where it leads you later. Uh, you could be a YouTuber, you could be a blogger, influencers. If you know how to do social media, you could be someone's social media manager for businesses or individuals you may know. You could be a photographer. I have a friend right now. Uh, what's up, Devon? I don't know if you're ever going to watch this, but he, he, hey, he's got a business right now. I see him on Facebook all the time. He's doing well. Uh, internet side hustles. Well, those are just a few, but again, if you have talents, if you have knowledge, uh, you can sell an ebook or an audiobook. Uh, you can make an online course. Be careful how you try to market online courses. Definitely try to be more genuine about it if you can, or even teach people, you know, online through Skype, Zoom, or in person, you know, possibly if you want to test out the idea first, make sure what you have is definitely feasible. Uh, you could do t-shirts if you know how to do uh, graphic designs, do printable designs on t-shirts, uh, wallpapers, hats, uh, calendar books. Uh, I, I have, I don't know where it is, but I definitely have... <laughs> A, a calendar book with how, how can i say how, 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 do, how, do, how do i say this exactly it has exactly what i need for is like plan, plotting out my day it's i'm not saying Dan calendar it's a planner it's like all the time slots in the day multiple note sections uh you know a daily review or a weekly review i went through so many on amazon to find ones that i liked and i might just end up designing one myself I do like the last one I have. It doesn't even have days at the top. You put in the day, so you don't end up wasting pages. Some of these are kind of expensive, but definitely having a, having a planner and actually using it, which I should be using for this. I have notebooks all over the place. I should be more structured, but I have OneNote. I got OneNote on my phone. I have Samsung Notes, and then I have all these notebooks just hanging around my place. So I need to put everything together, but I'm starting to. I'm using OneDrive and uh, OneNote. Um, that's it. Dropbox and OneDrive. I'm using that now to kind of condense everything, but I do need to start using my planner. Because it's around here, and I haven't used it much, so. Sorry, Mom. I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. She hasn't seen that thing in a while, so she probably doesn't even know how to have it. Anyway, what's next? Uh, drop shipping. Print on demand. Like I said before, well, this isn't print on demand, but you can, you can design hoodies. If you can design hoodies around a good time of the year, things happening in your particular school, town, something like that. Uh, if you like music. You can sell, you get music royalties, you can sell beats, or you can actually just make music and get royalties from that as well. Uh, if you do photography, you can uh, do stock photos. That's, that's a good way to do it. Or actually, you know, sell your businesses to people who have events coming up or need headshots taken. Yeah. So those are side hustles. Um, some that may be more along, you might want to start these off as businesses maybe easier because you definitely want to have some safety nets in place. Um, Turo and hire a car, loaning out your car. You definitely want to make sure you know exactly how your insurance company is going to view that. Um, yeah, or at least if you have an apartment, Airbnb, definitely knowing uh, their, their stance on short-term rentals because they may end up just kicking you out. So next, self-employed. I uh, put consultant, coaching, lawyer, dentist, accountant, fitness trainer. I put social media manager over there as well. If you're making enough money, I would say if I had a side hustle making half of what I made in my normal job, depending on how much I made, let's say, okay, median income in the U.S. is probably around 30 to mid 30s, maybe low, for, maybe low 40s. If you could do a side hustle that can make someone's median income, that technically is a business. And if you don't have, uh, you know, friends or family helping you out and you're doing it yourself, if you, can, if you aren't making that much to begin with, you can technically move over to that full time and all your money can come from that. However, in that case, you definitely want to know that you can scale it up so that, you know, 
you're not saying, okay, 40,000, 40,000, you're making 80 with your main job and side hustle. But as soon as you take out the job, you're back to 40. You definitely make sure you know you can scale that up so you can, you know, get that income that you're missing now. Or if you have another business, if all your businesses together can equal your main job and it's becoming too stressful for you to have that main job still and you can't grow because, you know, that eight to nine hours a day or 10 hours, you're sticking to that. Then yeah, uh, I would say leave and take that time. And if you already have that growth, you already have that income, just pour it right into your projects, pour it right into what you have and grow, uh, expand yourself. Business, uh, let's see, I put, I put some notes at the top here. So self-employed, own a job, service-based. Uh, yeah, so you don't have a job, you technically own your job, so you can't really fire yourself. You can, though. Um, only bankrupt, I guess, is one way to do it. For business, I put own products and systems, like I said before. If you're going to hire people in, or if you have products already that you've, you know, put your stamp of approval on, uh, whether it's a course or a merch line, that could be a business, as long as it's paying you. I put on here uh, construction or trucking. Those mostly require at least, you know, having hired help. Uh, things outside of that, I mean, technically, I mean, most of, I think most of it is pretty much hired help for businesses. You have employees. You have employees. Um, technically, if you don't have employees, I see. Even if, if you freelance, if you, like, outsource some things, yes. And, like, you work alone, but you outsource a few things. Yeah, I can, I can start other businesses. So, next, investors. So, own assets. Money works for you. So, yeah. I mean, putting your money in the stock market, your money is technically working for you. That's how it should be. That's how it should work. That's the point of it. Investing in the stock market. Yeah. Long-term investments. Even if you invested in the bottom of the market crash in 2020, at the peak, let's see, sometime in December of 2021, that's 105%. You would have doubled your money. Now, so today is more 86%, but that's still plenty of growth. Uh, let's see. From 20, the bottom of 2019, let's see, December 21st, actually December 21st, 2018, to February 14th of 2020, that was only 40%. But yeah, we've, 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 had, we've had a very nice high ever since March of 2020, and we're only just now finally going into the next, you know, uh, recession cycle, which I guess kind of hit August of 2020, but it lasted, it lasted August, September, October, it lasted two months. And then back in October, it just fluttered right up again. And in that case, that was 45%. Just from those uh, October, November, December, four months, 20%. You never, you never know what the stock market is going to do. You just know you should be able to get a different, decent average from it. So, for an investor, I put uh, real estate, residential, multifamily, single family, Airbnb, tiny homes. I've seen a lot of that on YouTube. Tiny homes are definitely becoming popular, especially in places where it's, I say, on the no, sorry, West Coast. Uh, Nevada, Utah, California, areas like that, maybe even Texas, possibly. Uh, you can look for a commercial space. So you can make an event space, a pop-up kitchen. Uh, you can have a small church come in. You can use it for anyone who wants to do demonstrations or trainings or who just wants a party space. Why not? Um, parking lot. You can own a parking lot or you can make a business that uh, kind of comes in and refurbishes the parking lot, you know, puts the lot lines down, you know, the spray measures out everything, maybe even fix the asphalt. That's, that's a business, but I was just throwing it on there and you can actually own a parking lot, you know, for people to get in and out. I don't know any that are for sale, but I'm pretty sure they would cost quite a, quite a bit of money for the land by itself. Uh, crowdfunded syndication. This is all still under real estate. Uh, you can do crowdfunded real estate. So Fundrise is an app. Um, that's technically one way that uh, you can get into real estate. It's pretty much investing, another way of investing in REITs. Uh, real Estate Investment Trust, you can get those in the stock market or you can use Fundrise. I think there's another app that's similar. Uh, you can do syndication. You have to be an accredited investor, I believe, for syndications. Um, most of the time. I believe for, I know Brandon Turner, he has one. I don't know if you do need to be one. You possibly do. But I know Grant Cardone is kind of the name that's been thrown around a lot. He has his own syndication. But I think uh, Brandon Turner, uh, author, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, I know he has his own uh, his own syndication uh, for getting real estate. And they've been doing this for years, so he's definitely well experienced. Uh, next, stocks. So 
different types of ways you can get into stocks. Maybe some you've heard of, maybe some you haven't. Uh, common versus preferred shares. When Warren Buffett, when he was buying, investing those in those companies for large sums of money, preferred shares, uh, he was getting higher dividend payments than the common shares if the common shares even gave dividends. So if you can go invest in a stock now, it may not pay dividends, it might. Preferred shares, I believe on the basis they can come with dividend payments. I think that's between like the investor and the business itself. Uh, I don't think that's a one, that's definitely not a one-on-one -on -one thing us institutional investors can kind of come in and do, <laughs> but uh, that's institutional, right? Probably either way. Um, no, I did not that right. Just us normal people can do, but um, if a company does pay dividends, preferred shares get paid out first. If that company goes bottom up, common shares do not. So just throwing it out there. Uh, you can invest in growth types of stocks. So it's not really a type of share, but it's generally the nature of the company. So you have growth, value, blue chip, and dividend. Those are the four that I pretty much have heard of. If you have penny stocks, I would advise not investing in penny stocks. Just don't. Just don't. Uh, dividend. Part of the dividend stocks, uh, like I said before, equity REITs. They have some nice dividends. Uh, companies in the energy sector also as well. Um, ones that in, ones that invest in, I guess, like pipelines or land or infrastructure. Generally, those pay REITs because they kind of have like an ongoing payment model with whoever's using their service, and they don't need to continuously build new infrastructure all the time. They already have it existing. Uh, next, index funds. Uh, index funds are probably the best way to get into investing. If you open an account with like Vanguard or Schwab or Fidelity, you don't have to put a ton of money into them. I know. At least maybe Van. I don't know about Vanguard. I haven't checked them recently, but I know some of their index funds. You need to start with like a thousand or three thousand dollars. I don't know if it's changed since then. I don't like their website, so I don't use the service. I rather just use Fidelity. If I'm going to do stuff like that, and even at Fidelity, you can invest. I think a dollar, even a hundred dollars minimum in an index fund, or you're straight. Maybe even a stock as well. Uh, mutual funds. Mutual funds. Uh, they generally have higher costs than index funds, so. Sometimes with the life insurance companies, they'll probably offer you investments as well. Definitely take a look at the performance of those investments and how, how much they uh, require in fees. Wow, I do, get the, uh, I do get the popular opinion of saying, hey, we're doing this for safety. You know, if they're doing it, they're, they're going to change the fund based on you, whether it's a target date fund or just a mutual fund. They're going to change, you know, the... Uh, what's comprised in that fund, like for you so that, you know, you can be safe and have most of your money if you're close to retirement or far from retirement, however it is. I just don't like the returns. And if I'm going to put my money in something that it's going to be in there for seven, 10 years minimum already, if it's going to be in there for two to three, four times that anyway, and I know, and I'm counting on growth, why would I want anything that's less than that? Now, I guess I get the point to where it's like, oh, okay, if you're near retirement and your investments tank and you have to wait another year or two or three, you know, for it to come back up, it probably won't take three years. It's back in the day, it would take that long. It probably is definitely less than two years, two and a half years, definitely less than two years. I think for most of the crashes we've had in at least the past 20, 30 years, maybe. Outside of 2008, I forgot how long 2008 lasted, but I definitely don't think it was years. <clears throat> anyway. Even in that case, what was it the dot com bubble? Yes. Even in that case, that's what your emergency fund is for. And by the time you get ready to retire, if you haven't thrown everything into investments, if you have, if you own your residence or if you have like a multifamily unit, you can still live there and you know still get some some income out of that. Or you you have your emergency fund that you've possibly even kept growing for like you know the next 10 years or so if you're like 50 you want to retire at 60 or 40 retire at 50 you should have money elsewhere at least in that case and that's just my opinion like even though i'm throwing a decent amount of my take-home pay into investments i have a nice cash egg on the side but right now that's mainly for me to get real estate however if i spend that on a down payment guess what i'm gonna start filtering my money back into cash uh, however much I can afford to without messing up, you know, how much I'm printing off for investments, uh, at least for that time being. I'm going to try not to. I might have to reduce it. Well, no, who sees? We'll see. Yeah. Various, various different types of ways to get into stocks. Uh, you could throw bonds in there. They're all right, but yeah. ETFs are probably one of the best ways to do it. 
mostly because they're a collection of stocks, um, depending on what platform you're going through as well. They don't take as much money as some as an index fund if if they don't have cheap index funds. If they do have that one to three thousand dollar cap, you might want to go with someone else who starts with maybe a dollar or a hundred dollars. You can get into ETF, ETFs or index funds. They generally can follow the same uh, the same standards. I'm trying to find the where I'm trying to figure the same. I guess secondly, index funds follow indexes. ETFs can also follow indexes. Uh, but technically, they can also follow follow anything. To be honest, um, you want to be careful when going with ETFs. So let's say the stock market, at least with the the GICS level, there are nine sectors. So even if you find an ETF that is supposedly following a particular sector, you're going to find that they differ in how much money they allocate to particular stocks. You might even find that there are some stocks included or not included between them all. So I would generally go with uh, ETFs that have large sums of money already in them, some of the more popular ones. Um, technically, you can go with SPY or IBV or uh, VOO. They, are, they all follow the S&P 500 index. They all pretty much have the same uh, growth uh, over time, up and down. Um, the biggest difference would be the fees. So SPY has a bit more fees, uh, has a bit of higher fees than VOO. I'll have to go with VOO. I mean, same performance, less fees. You know, the fees are very small to begin with, but why not just you know minimize much, how much you pay for that in the first place? Last but not least, well, not last but not least, we're coming on the last bit of this this list here in the investor category that I have so far. Definitely a lot more I can put in here, and I can definitely uh, go into more detail about this later. Cryptocurrency. I pretty much just really buy Bitcoin and Ethereum now, uh, and also as uh, anything that's kind of tied, at least what they say is like a stable coin. Uh, those usually have higher rates for interest, um, but everything else is pretty much rise and falls just as much as Bitcoin or Ethereum does. Unless that's something to do with, you know, the metaverse. Maybe some of those are a bit different, but uh, Bitcoin type of cryptocurrencies, they're, they're usually based on like a store value. Some of them are mostly going to be used for currency. That's why Bitcoin also has Bitcoin Cash. They want to use it as a currency rather than a store value. Ones like Ethereum, they're going to be more, um, they're more like workhorses. They're like, they have actual uses and depending on those uses and applications there will be um they're pretty much you know they they work on smart contracts so depending on the uses and applications for ethereum uh based coins or at least what it will they call it uh staking i guess yeah most most of those coins you can stake uh they don't they kind of started cutting off the mining aspect to those um but yeah the value of those kind of cryptocurrencies is really based on the software applications that can be used with them and generally over time, that's definitely going to rise. There's going to be much more of a, of a market use for a lot of these uh, growing in the future. So I technically think Ethereum has the potential to pass Bitcoin as far as usefulness and kind of uh, widespread uh, adoptability. But we'll definitely see. I just invest in both right now. I used to invest in a bunch of other coins like Litecoin. Um, I had a little bit of money in Doge, uh, DAI, depending on what platform has a nice interest rate, depending. Right, let's see what's next. Life insurance. If you're about that, life insurance can definitely be a wonderful thing. If one, you can afford it. Um, technically, if you can get it with your job, that's best and the cheapest way to go about it. Uh, definitely getting it when you're younger also helps you mitigate some of the costs if you get it elsewhere through another uh, company. Uh, commodities, uh, metals, agriculture, livestock, energy, not that exciting. I don't think I really will put my money in too much of that, but who knows? Maybe when, you know, I actually consider myself somewhat wealthy, <laughs> um, I'll look to diversify just a little bit more, depending on like, you know, what looks good to me at, the, at a particular point in time. Uh, land, like I said before, you can have a parking lot, you can have land to build houses on, you can have land for farmland, uh, things like that. Or, you know, if you want to go that route, grow cannabis, you know, up to you. If you can uh, get the licensing and everything down for that. Uh, Peter Penn Lending, very popular. Uh, they have Lending Club and I believe Prosper. Those are the two apps I've heard of. Um, actually, before, I don't think both of them had an app for Androids, but now they both definitely do. So that's very interesting. I have a lot of my uh, finance apps on my phone. It makes it so easy than trying to sign in on my computer through the website on my phone, unless I'm going to use my laptop, you know, 
Let's see, let's see, let's see. High yield savings account or CDs. I would definitely stray more to high yield savings accounts. And in this particular case, you're probably not going to get anything more than 0.4, maybe a 0.5. Uh, like I said before, Chase doesn't have very good uh, savings rates. <laughs> if you want to go with uh, credit unions, credit unions, some of them have a, a high yield account up to 1%. The one I have has 1%, but only up to a certain amount of money. So anything after that is basically pennies, kind of like a normal bank account. So anything up to that limit, I get a nice percentage on. But there's some other things in there that I have to do to make sure I secure that. And I'm kind of thinking maybe I should just move my money out to somewhere else. Uh, we'll see how I do that in the next couple months. We'll see. Just having money stashed in different places isn't, isn't I know, harm to me either. I can always, you know, move it out within two or three days. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, I can just save it from my phone. So, American Express, Ally Bank, um, Capital One 360 is nice as well. Uh, da, da, da. I said Ally Made It. Marcus uh, by Goldman Sachs is nice. And Ally Credit Union has it. Um, uh, first, first, first Northern Credit Union also. Uh, most of them are online banks, pretty much. Uh, if you wanted to get, uh, if you want to get into those banks that have like prize pools and everything, there's one called Prize Pool. There's also Yada Bank. They uh, they basically give you tickets to win uh, cash prizes every week, and I'm pretty sure it just comes from the money they 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 lend out because of course they lend out money at a higher rate than they pay you, and you can win some money that way through either one of those. I do have accounts. No links for those yet, but. Any links I do have, I'll put in the description below. Let me know if you want to, if you want my opinion on any particular app or uh, company that I just mentioned. Let me know. The silent partner and angel investor. That's when you start having big bucks, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, and you want to, you know, start your own company or invest in somebody else's. Uh, some of these can be crowdfunded. Others can mostly, most likely, if it's like an angel investor, most likely you're, you're, uh, it's more like a Shark Tank kind of deal. And then I, I put internet down here at the, at the bottom for investor. But um, I guess this is what you would kind of call digital real estate. So if you had a blog uh, and you had display advertising using Google AdSense, you get money that way. Affiliate marketing, another way. You can do that on YouTube. You can do that with a blog as well. Uh, sponsor content. If you are a content creator, uh, companies can reach out to you to make videos or posts, you know, it could be on TikTok, Instagram, not just YouTube or blogs. And they could pay you for a particular post or mentioning them or some of their products in a particular post. You could even have an ongoing campaign as well. Uh, you definitely want to market yourself very well, or at least uh, if you're big, I say over like 50,000 subscribers, maybe 100,000 subscribers, maybe. Um, if you do get deals like that, if you uh, definitely may be getting someone who's uh, experienced and kind of professional to like look through those contracts for you so you don't get hit up by everyone and you know potentially choose something shady or uh, you know you just don't want to deal with all that all that incoming spam just get a uh, get someone else to look over that for you and then someone you trust someone that you know has a good track record someone you trust as well if you're not going to go with uh, someone who already does this for a living and uh, that's all i filled in for now there's definitely a lot more i can put in here so i'm probably gonna go through some of my notes that i have spread around all these different <laughs> uh, cloud services and everything I've written down in my notebooks. And we'll definitely see where I fill some of these things in. Um, yeah, learning something new just about every other day. And when I'm not learning some new information, I'm definitely applying some new source of skill or trying to acquire new skills. That's what I'm trying to do now. I do apologize. I do get sidetracked with um, sometimes little side adventures that i might have i'm technically trying to do like three different types of content right now and uploading i don't have a very good schedule to do so but once i get that down we won't have any more interruptions once again uh comment on the video if you have any questions uh just stay and tell me how the video is how's the audio how's the how's, how's the video itself is there any, anything you have questions about is there anything you would like me to talk about in the future or anything you would like me to to kind of pass on whether it be my basic budget or more screenshots of kind of just how I visualize uh, some of this contextual information that I've learned over the past couple of years. Or if you just want to know what I'm looking into, what I'm uh, watching, you know, lately, that's fine as well. Definitely remember to like the video. And if you can, give me a comment or you can just, uh, even if then, you can just go to Instagram. I don't have a lot of posts in there yet, but they will be coming. I will have lots more clips. And I will start uh, getting my list together for 
people to interview so we can have some guests and that's gonna be fun i already have maybe three or four in mind including some close friends and family members so definitely be sure to subscribe and be in tune for that all right everyone i want to thank you once again for checking out the podcast definitely hit up my instagram you can find my link tree there or i can put the link tree in the description as well i don't know why i keep saying that but you can find the podcast on it should be on google now possibly uh most likely you would definitely be able to find it on spotify and apple itunes as well the video course is on youtube and i use red circle so if you uh want to just go through the initial red circle link i'll be able to see the analytics from that right away uh, but yeah let me know anyway y'all be safe make sure you learn something work on your goals and as always see you next time